Okay, so um, we'll have like 30, 40 minute presentation. Um, after me, Giorgio Salentis will speak from the European Commission. Then Michiel Lenaars from NLNet on the NGR Next Generation Internet Study. And then Marietje Schaken from the European Parliament. Um, I will just have a few stories. And I think this is one of them. I think we basically know this slide. This is a little bit of an extremely old school situation here. Um, I never actually took a selfie, but I'm tempted to start taking one. But I'm also tempted to start in the thing, which probably is not a very good idea. Um, so this actually is the old school situation that we all know that we want to get away from. Now we know that Burroughs is right. We need some kind of manager for the planet, but it will not be a manager. Like it will be a network, it will be a team, it will be a community, just like we heard. So just a few stories. Um, these are the Fukeshu, and they were Ronin, samurai without a master, and they could not carry a sword. And they were living around uh, 16, 1700 in Japan. And when you see, and they're still around, they play shakubashi music. And so what they did was they moved into a temple. Uh, they stayed there for about 10 years and didn't do anything. Then after 10 years, they got out. Uh, and they went to see the shogun, Edo, and they asked him, can we go out and play shakubashi music in the streets and collect arms? And the shogun said, okay, you can do that, but then you have to spy for me, because you wear these masks, you, nobody's looking at you, you hear everything. And so they said yes. So they wore the mask. Now when you see this, you see there's a mask. But when they take off the mask, there's another mask. It's good old Nietzsche, eine maske mehr, give me another mask, another mask. Basically, in the end, it's a group of people coming together, starting something. And this, I think, at this moment in time, with Internet of Things, AI, the big over-the-top players, the Ubers, the Facebooks, the Googles, we all know them, sometimes it feels like it's sort of set, the game is done, but it isn't done. There's an alternative, and there's always an alternative, and all the situations are historical. And to me, this story was always very important because it shows that at any moment in time, if we have enough building blocks, we can start a new situation, a new given. This also was very important for me. This is, um, these are volcano uh, readings. And for decades, actually for over a century, the volcanologists thought that the data was in the middle layer. And they had theory after theory, and they threw ID after ID into that middle layer, but nothing came out of it. Because at some point there was a physicist, Bernard Chouet, he looked at this and he realized that the data is in the other layer. The data is in the small layer over there. And he actually managed to get out data and information from that, and now the, volcano the volcanologists are actually working with his theory. What was very interesting to me is that it's actually possible for a whole group of people to get such tunnel vision for, for decades, for maybe even over a century, that they, they will not believe that they could actually, they should look at something else, unless of course it takes another position to start doing that. And I think that's where we are, because the questions that we have is very simple. And actually, it really, really is very simple. So what this next generation internet, this NGI wants to, um, wants to get up, wants to sort of start a debate on, well, first of all, the debate needs to be public. We need to get a lot more people involved in thinking with these questions. Because we can only get one shot at making this a smart society if we want to make it smart, and so the smart is what it is. So the question is, what kind of smart society do we want? And you're here, and you're very much a part of this. So how can we build a kind of Team Europe, a kind of network communities, like a 500 million platform, making people, processes, and machines wiser every day in a meaningful way? Thank you. So now we move over to Giorgio, with Giorgio Salentis. Um, you want this one, or you want the mic? Okay. Yes. yes, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm coming from the European Commission. Uh, it's the 
executive arm of the European institutions. Uh, and I, it's a privilege to be in a venue like this. My background, however, is in engineering. So long time ago, I used to also coding, but I am ashamed to say how long time ago. Uh, now I'm going to give you what the European, I'm going to give you very briefly uh, uh, the timelines and some of the elements regarding budgets and efforts that the Commission is putting behind this initiative. Uh, what are we talking about here? We are talking about a new uh, and ambitious initiative of the European Commission. In the branch where I work, of the European Commission, we are funding research. Just to, for having very quick uh, uh, set of who in the room, if you can wave, received funds from European projects, if you can very quickly to see. Okay, not so many, that's a good sign. <laughs> but we hope, we hope that with this type of, of, of uh, initiatives, we will try to attract as many as possible to you. So uh, I'm not going to say and repeat some of the things that you already know. How important is the internet uh, today uh, and how important is it uh, for the society? We can, we can have, if we have a snapshot now, uh, we can see that still we are at the infancy. We can, we can see new radical functionalities popping in. However, we see also problems popping in. We see fragmentation, we see concentration of power, and for the citizens in particular, we see some security and privacy concerns. Uh, what we will try to do, and we will try to put, to put wisely the money we put for Research for Europe, is try to build an internet that serves the citizens. And for that, we ask the question, what, what can we do? And the obvious answer for us is that we defend with our policies European values and we will try to do the same thing with this initiative. So we will push for the European values with the vehicle of the internet uh, that we are going to develop. So the trends that we see nowadays are trends about having artificial intelligence on the hype which is supported by a plethora, a plethora of data that is available. I mean, if I make a, a, a comparison to when I started my career in the university, and I see because uh, I was looking also at artificial intelligence, the, the algorithms have not much, much evolved, but what has evolved, and it is dramatic change, is the availability of huge amounts of data for training, for example, and the connectivity, combined with cheap processing power at the edges of the internet. So, as I said, principles of what we want to have. We want to have a, an, in, an internet which is human-centric, at the service of the people and of the society. And for this, we need the help, and I will make the point later on, we need the help of ma many disciplines but we will not forget that one of the disciplines that is at the core of the internet is the, tech, the society that is building the, the, the small bi bits and pieces of the internet. So another thing is that uh, already we have the, the people, the, 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 if I can say the, the dinosaurs that were since the inception and they are still giving their, their nice guidelines and talks but the other thing that we need if we want to do this change is that we need to mobilize the youngest talents that are shaping now uh, uh, the internet. And I could not imagine a better venue for doing so than to address to this venue here. So um, if I can give you a roadmap how, how this has evolved so far from our side, what, what did, we do so far, did we do so far? We started with a consultation uh, we try to, to reach as many as possible and we try to, to, to get the feeling what, what, what an initiative like this should have as ingredients. Then the second step is that we launch a study and Michel after me will present 
uh, some of the wisdom that we got from this, uh, from this study. Uh, and we started already uh, in our cycle of programs that we have, which is the framework programs, we start injecting money, asking for calls. So already we have the first bits and pieces of, of, of what we think we'll have in the next generation internet and how we can support it from the European point of view. Uh, but the big, the big challenge is laying, laying uh, ahead of us. And as now I'm talking, the, uh, the European Commission is, is, is planning for the multi-annual framework program. So where are we going to put the money in Europe in general? And in particular, where are we going to put the money to support research and more uh, uh, in detail how are we going to do this initiative? Um, so one thing that I, th I believe is essential for you as a community, I will not bother you with the, all the, 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 the mechanics of the calls and all this, is that we adopt a little bit of different strategy here. Um, a typical problem in our, in, our, in our program is that from the moment we launch a call for supporting researchers doing whatever kind of research to the moment of the implementation, the time was too long. And particularly in research, you cannot do that. Particularly in research that deals with uh, technological uh, advances like the internet that is evolving really fast. The second thing is that we are notorious for our, uh, uh, if I can say so, bureaucracy and rules which are coming also by a control. I mean, in the beginning when I was outside the commission, I would say, what, what is all this bureaucracy? Now that I enter inside, I can see that there is a need also for a budgetary control. But this has a problem of, of delaying things. So we adopt a, 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 a model of cascade funding, we call it. So what we are going to do is we are going to launch. I, I, I tell it briefly in simple words. We launch a call, and this call gives money to intermediaries that can then cascade this type of funds during the implementation of this program to smaller groups, even individuals, and then these can do the necessary research for this initiative. So one, init one important issue is the cascade funding, which I think makes and opens the door for communities that usually are outside. That's why I asked the, the question who, who participated so far. So it opens the door for communities or for individuals to come in, get support, and collaborate because it's not only the funding that make, make is important in this sense, it's also the collaboration across Europe, we hope. That's what we support. So just to give you very quickly the numbers, for the last of this framework program, which is ending in 2020, we have put a bet of 50 million euros around. And this is in the form of what are called intermediaries, where we have two calls, and in each call we are going to call three different areas, uh, and where intermediaries would get something like seven millions, and will then cascade them to people. The, 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 the upcoming uh, uh, call is going to close, for the intermediaries is going to call, close now in April, and from April and onwards, those intermediaries are going to inject this 7 million euro that I say uh, 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 gradually. Uh, we also put some money for support actions that are going to support uh, also the, uh, uh, the reach out to the communities and also the uh, uh, exploitation of results. Uh, and also we put some money for international col collaboration in particular with the US because we believe that what happens in the internet cannot be stay in the European. When we initially started, we, we may have also other collaboration in other programs we do so, but we started a very close collaboration with the United States and uh, uh, we put also some money there. Uh, so the big bet now is what will happen in the next uh, framework program, and this framework program, we are talking about an escalation in, in terms of budget, but I think the most important is the multiplicative effect we expect to have 
in terms of engagement of people and communities. Now, uh, as I said, I, I, I showed you the timeline, I showed you the money, and now I want to talk about the most important thing, which is the people. Uh, and as I said, there are communities that we could reach so far with our programs, the researchers, the research institutes, but there are communities like this one, or like uh, the people who are dealing with civil society, the people who are uh, not purely technical, that I think we are, are indispensable and necessary for this initiative. So the multidisciplinary uh, uh, context of developing this initiative is of prime importance. And the most, I could say, the most interesting thing is that we want, uh, ha we, wa we will strive to have the people that are talented, that could not find so far through our usual type of, of, of funding and support. Uh, we wish to have them aligned towards the same initiative, the initiative as I presented so uh, in, in the beginning. So uh, I would pass the floor now to Michiel. Uh, there is a simple uh, site where our support action there aggregates all the information and I thank you for your attention. Okay, is this, is this, this on? So I quickly have to, to switch. So now I come from a completely different world uh, in a sense. Um, we, uh, we did this study uh, for the commission, uh, uh, even though I swore to myself I would never ever work with the commission again because I totally hated the way that funding works and I found it to be ineffective and I found it to be a charade. However, we ran into the right people. Um, so I work for a charity called Enelnet Foundation. We've been around since 82. Uh, this is Teus Hagi, he's in the Internet Hall of Fame. He's really cool. Um, and I'm second generation uh, within NLNet, so I'm, uh, but already gray beard, so we're, we're in there for a long while. Um, so we, 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 we ran into the commission very early on in this process, this first uh, consultation in, in 2016. And we thought, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster, but we need this money. Uh, so we, we assembled the crack team and we, and we set out the work. Now, before we, we talk about uh, an initiative like the Next Generation Internet, the problem is, of course, what is that? I mean, people have a, a pretty crappy idea of what the Internet is. Uh, I mean, to them, it's, a, it's, it's like a box, and you just buy a new box, and then you, you start inventing it. And it's a little, I don't know if people recall this image, but the Internet, it, you're connected to the Internet, it works, and then you're done, uh, it, just like an old TV. Uh, this is more like the internet, and it's, it's, it's really vastly complex. And it's not a thing. It's a network of independent networks. So you can't upgrade them all because they're all different. They're not coherent. They're owned and operated by different people. And there's some glue in there which is shared, but this, this, is, this, is, this is on the top. Uh, uh, but th those are also operated by independent people. So there's not a single thing to do. And there's people interested in every aspect of it. And they're doing whatever they feel like. So another important thing is to, to know is that the internet had its brain split. And this is a, I don't know if people know who this is. This is Finn Cerf, one of the two inventors of the IP protocol. And he came to the Netherlands and he had a, a he gave a presentation there and he said at a certain point in time we just invented the, the, uh, the internet protocols and then uh, the NSA came to us uh, and said well that's not going to do that's, that's so not going to do we, yeah, we're gonna, you're going to need to invent, invent something else for us but oh by the way don't tell the others so that is a pretty painful thing that's the 70s that is going really back to the roots of the whole thing 
And so if, if you think about it, it's not something that you can create a next generation of quite easily. But you really want to do it. And, and where do you start? Where do you start when you have like the community? We have 500 million people in Europe with a, a, a big vessel of money. We're putting money aside to do this kind of thing. But then how do we organize that this, this can actually work? Well, obviously, so we, we try to drill down a little and say, well, it's not going to be the connections. They're not, they're not the problem. I mean, the whole physical layer is just, it's OK. That's why we initially believed in the internet, because we owned our own infrastructure. But now we get into more painful territory. We talk about conventions. We talk about standards. We talk about protocols. We talk about how people operate. Well, that's, that's a lot steeper to, to work on. And then there's code and there's commodity. There's the stuff that people are running and people that, that people can download and start using. And there's a lot of legacy hardware on it. And we have to attach that as well. And that includes all of the things that you own, including the thing in your, in your basement. Now, changing the core conventions and the core protocols of the internet, that is a huge beast of an effort. I mean, it's... It's, it's, it's bordering on, on, on the insane. Things have never changed before. People don't realize this, but it has never been done before. All the other things that are just individual companies with a few big companies doing the same thing, it's not still the internet. The internet has not done it before. The people that have to do it have not done it before. And to make it even worse, they sort of simultaneously, through all three and a half billion of them, will have to do it more or less in the same pace, because otherwise it's still not going to work. All previous internet, next, gen, internet, uh, next generation internet has failed. There's even a Wikipedia disambiguation page for it. And that's that. So the reality is this is, this is a moonshot plus plus effort. This is massacre. It's the largest and it's the most obscene thing that man has ever created. And we, and we want to change it in flight with three and a half billion people on board. And I mean, even the US alone has 11 billion of attack budget a year just to attack the security of the internet. So the political stakes are high, the economic stakes are high, and of course the social stakes are tremendously high. Now, we also have a bunch of, bunch of highly critical users, and when you talk about critical users, there's, there's different types of critical. They're not really critical because they will use anything that's free, but they're well, they're heavily addicted, heavily dependent, and they will whine. So it's going, to be a, it's going to be a tough thing. And then on top of that, I don't know if people, people probably know Parkinson's Law of Triviality. Uh, it's, when you, it's from the 50s when you design a nuclear power plant. You assign a, committee, uh, you assign a committee to work on that. They will end up fighting over the color of the bike shed because that's what everybody understands. Everybody gets the internet because everybody's modern and has a Twitter account. So, if you're still with me, if you're still not discouraged, this is the path that we took. We, we set out to engage with, with these folks. Ah, broken. This is the web. Um, uh, so we, we, we said, well, you, you can't do a next generation if you don't. I mean, how do you create next generation people? You have the current generation people, then you put them together, and they make next generation people have a lot of fun. These people have never been involved with this public funding because of the obnoxiousness of the whole process. You guys don't want the paperwork. Uh, but I work for a charity, uh, an LNET. We give away money to people. We do this kind of thing. Our budgets cannot reach here. This is a factor 1,000 higher than an LNET can reach. And we know, because all these people come to us over the years, uh, we know we need this money. We know there's, there's a huge demand out there for people that, that, that can actually do great things, but we need these, these, these technical experts. Now, we did a, 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 a workshop during this, this, uh, this call, and, and to be even more inclusive, this, th these are all the tags that we added to the people in that workshop. And so this includes also the people that wrote the Feminist Internet Manifesto. This also is about whistleblowers. This is about uh, all dimensions of the infrastructure because they all need to be, they all have their different needs and perspectives. Oh. Interesting. Uh, 
The problem is if you have a, 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 an internet, next generation internet plan and you have it all neatly tied up in graphs, when you don't have the glue for it, if you have separate calls and people will be yelling, okay, I can do something on mm, tran uh, 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 transmission protocols or I can do something on <coughs> secure web standards. But if it's not glued together, it's going to be a hail shot of effort. It's going to fail. Oh, man, this is getting irritating. I will have to refresh my browser because... That is so irritating. Okay, I'm going to have to wing it here. Um, so, ah, we have we have images coming up. Um, we did this massive scan. We worked for months and months. We talked, went to all these events from all these organizations. Uh, there's there's an end to what people can do. So we're just a small team. There's a lot of people working on the internet in Europe. And we made a huge, huge effort to talk to some, as many people as we could. And uh, if you look at the internet as a safe place where you can just use things, uh, do things and party, uh, you should think a little of the story about the three pigs. There's always a pig with a straw house, uh, and he's having a lot of fun. That's where we built the internet, next to that house. And the threat model that we have now is completely uh, 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 the threat model at the time was completely inadequate. This is the kind of threat model that we want. You, you will have AI attacks uh, from whatever nation you don't like, and they will find every gaping uh, go hole, every port, every so bit of source code that, that is out there that is vulnerable. So you're going to need some pretty uh, uh, fast response time. We don't have response time now. We have a pretty awful response time. If people have, break something on the internet, it takes years to fix it. When DNS was broken, you still, uh, in 2008, people are still seeing out there uh, DNS servers that don't have DNSSEC. Uh, IPv6 has been waiting since, since the previous century. We t it takes ages to put things on the internet. And so we, 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 we're very bad at this. We're really bad at organizing things because all of your projects, they end up, I don't know if people know this wonderful site called ripology.org, and if you've checked your projects there, what, how, how, how well they spread across, uh, uh, even across just Linux distros, it takes ages and ages. We don't have good mechanisms. Uh, and when, when you're building a new internet, you can't afford not to be in, in connected to everything. So we need uh, good engineering practices. We need continuous integration. We need, well, a, a lot of the, the things that, that, that just make sense from a software engineering point of view, make sense when you're doing a next generation internet. We don't have that. Um, like I mentioned before, we need this trust from the ground up. The, the internet is, the fundaments of the internet are deeply problematic. And I mean, after Snowden, everybody realizes this. So how do we re-engineer this trustworthiness? Because we can make people trust the internet, but that would be, a, well, it would be disastrous if they trust the thing that's not to be, tr that, that isn't trustworthy. So we have to earn back this trust. And, and that will take a lot of effort. Now, in the long term, we know that, for instance, DDoS attacks, uh, they're simply, they cannot be stopped. The internet is designed in a pretty bad way. It's a pretty naive uh, uh, idea of how the network should be in, in the 70s. So we need alternative plans. There, there needs to be a plan B. And, and, and this goes on, on, on many different levels. This goes from... from uh, making sure that uh, objects don't have to come from a single server like I just had, but they can just be there. The, the frigging image was on my frigging computer, but it just wouldn't show because my browser was too stupid to recognize that it was there. So why can we not have smarter asset distribution to make it less fragile? We want anti-fragility. Uh, now, what I mentioned before is the legacy middleware. Uh, 
the internet is hostile against itself. It's basically, whenever you invent new stuff, other parts of the internet are saying, well, but I was created in the 80s and I don't understand, so I'll eject this. And you have to work on the internet, so stop, stop using whatever you're doing. And so, for instance, even protocols like DNSSEC, which are a rescue uh, uh, in, in, to an important aspect, 10% of the, of, the, of, the, of the networks have issues with, with DNSSEC packets. So we, we know that we need to think clever, more clever, not just about a solution, but about a solution that is able to, to take care of this, this, this legacy situation. And that means that we have to understand far better. And that takes a lot of money, a lot of brain power, because thinking of stuff that works is more difficult than thinking of stuff that works in a non-greenfield situation. Now, the user uh, also needs a lot more protection. If you go to a store now and you buy a laptop and you go online here, you, you're, you're dead meat. How can this be? How can this be after we invent protocols for so long that you buy new stuff, you go on a public internet, and you're, 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 you're taken? So of course, this takes a lot of stuff. And I mean, we've lost control of the browser. Uh, I think everybody's. Can, can, can see that this is advertising companies running the show. This is no longer serving the interest of the user. So why don't we make public money uh, to be used for that purpose? Another important uh, thing uh, is, I don't know how many people are here mining Bitcoin and together with all the other people producing, uh, I think the 19th country when it comes to uh, electrical power already, and that's with 300,000 payments or 400,000 payments a day. That's nothing. That's, there are supermarkets in my, in my city that have that traffic volume, and that is the 19th pollutant in electricity use on the planet. If people are going to go that way, and people are proposing blockchain-like solutions, we're going to have to do a lot better. And so this is something that, again, you want people to look into. You want people to have time to spend on this. Now, if people... Uh, uh, are supposed to be going away from, from, from the, the big monopolies, where are they going to go? I mean, if there's no road and if there's no, no destination, there's no way that they even can get away. So you need to safeguard the openness of the Internet by making sure that, that there's no monopolies. Uh, and if people need stuff, then it needs to be available, just like the email is available or the web is available. Anybody can use it. Now this is the process that we uh, that I explained. So we had this. Uh, we talked to all these communities. We uh, we analyzed what they said. We met up with a lot of experts from the community, uh, and then we made an even further breakdown. And what we then did is to recommend to the commission three different topics. Uh, of first, we extracted a vision for this. Because the vision is where it starts. The vision is, uh, uh, th there can be many visions. For instance, there was a, for, for, for the, the previous decades, there was a vision, Europe should have its own Googles. You, go Europe should have its own Amazons. Europe should have all these uh, the big companies lookalikes. Uh, that, is, that is not a good idea. That is never going to cut it. So we start with a vision. And this vision basically revolves around a very few simple principles. It is legible, but I actually extra extracted it in a bigger size. Now, if you agree that the, 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 the idea of the next generation, next generation internet isn't profit, but that it, that it should be an area that brings out the best in all of us, then this inclusiveness and, 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 and diversity uh, uh, are a real problem because that's not what the world is heading for. We're not heading towards an inclusive system. If you work at a few uh, big companies, you can invent the future, and if not, you're basically you're, you're a fringe activity. The second thing, uh, the, the, uh, so, so the, that's the basic essence. We want everybody to be, to be on board. But the second thing is we want the internet to actually be very resilient. Because if you think about it, you're going to put things inside your heart and it's actually going to grow. You're going to put it in space and you can't touch it. You're going to put it in the roads. And 
imagine that the spectral meltdown would happen with stuff inside your heart or inside a road. There's a, there are good reasons to minima, minimize the attack surface, and that happens at the protocol layer. The next thing is, of course, we need these components, we need everything to be trustworthy. Because if, if you couldn't trust your own spine, I mean, you, I, I, people may have seen this Bruce Willis film where, he is, uh, where there's a, a spy inside one of his teeth, uh, and he has to uh, get it out of his own. If you can't trust your own uh, internet, you have to be able to trust it. It's your internet, right? It's, we said it's a decentralized infrastructure, so it's yours. So you should be able to trust it. You should know and understand what is in there. And the third thing, everybody should be able to innovate on top of it. You can't innovate on top of uh, Twitter. You can create an app that uses its API, but you cannot build a new business model on top of a company like that. So and this is this our call to action. Now, where to start? The first thing that we recommend to the commission is say, okay, first we need to clean up our act. We need to secure the parameter. We make, need to make sure that, that we at least have a minimum amount of ground that we know we can trust. Uh, that's, that's really the first thing. If, if we don't have that, uh, just spend a lot of, uh, you, you only have 5.4 million to spend on, on these, each of these three topics. This is well spent on people just t taking a clear look at the internet. The second thing is, Okay, if people are, uh, if we want people to be uh, uh, free to innovate, they have to be able to get their social graph out. They have to be able to get their data out. And they need to be able to take it somewhere. Just like if I don't like Gmail, I can set up my own email server. If I don't like many other services on the internet, the popular ones, the, the Instagrams, the, the, the signals, the uh, the, the Facebook, where am I going to go? If I, if I don't agree with that company that runs it, where am I going to go? So we need to create open source alternatives for these services and make sure that the data can be ported. And the third one that we recommend is renovation of architecture. So it, this is a long-term thing. It's, it's, we know that the first proposals to re-engineer the internet were from already from the 80s. None of them have succeeded. So it takes a long, long time to even get something done. So we need that kind of work, that long-term work to start right now. Now, where does this community come in? Okay, we, we know and we understand that you guys, you, you, you will have bread to eat. I mean, that's not a problem. And, and, and you don't need the paperwork from the commission. However, the interesting thing is the paperwork from the commission will go and you actually, we will need that work and you will, we, we actually need to collaborate and, and do stuff in a more structured way. It's if we're going to fly to the moon, if that is actually the kind of level of ambition that we have, it's not going to cut it uh, uh, from, a, from a technical point of view to do everything in separation, to scratch our own itches all the time. The internet is actually eating the world, it's eating society, it's, it's determining how people interact with each other. I mean, Trump versus, when, when, when President Trump, uh, Trump's account was taken down on Twitter, a couple of months ago by some engineer that felt like it. Uh, and there was no way, that, no way that would happen to a state organization uh, because the, you could put stuff in place. Because that is the same account that that guy threatens to, to foreign heads of state with. So it, that's a pretty, pretty strange thing to happen. We need, uh, society needs uh, an internet that it trusts. And if we want to, to, to launch this thing, we're going to have to collaborate. And we have to nurture the, the, the right and ethical technologies. And, well, the commission is continuously uh, being pestered uh, by, by uh, people from industry and uh, 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 citizens saying, why don't we have all these big companies in Europe? We're a failure. We've created uh, packet switching. We've created the web. We've created Linux. And then we don't have any of these, these, these uh, unicorn companies. Why? Why? Well, this is a cuckoo. I don't know if people know how that works. But if you get ousted of the net all the time because it's an unfair competition, uh, uh, and you keep on nurturing the whole system without giving it a second thought, if there are too many cuckoos and they're very successful, you start, they start consulting business. They start houses. Uh, they start uh, bed and breakfast places where you can go and 
uh, put your eggs in, and then well, it's it's kind of easy to just spot it out. I mean, the the real internet is open, and the real internet is owned by everybody. And if it's not that internet, then certainly we can recognize this, and we we hope that the uh, European Commission, when they get that billion euros uh, to, to do stuff, they will actually see it because that is our funding, that is your funding. And, and my eyes opened two years ago when I went to this workshop and there were 10 experts and there were no people from the internet world. So this was, uh, this is your lunch being eaten by people that claim to be you. This is actors that try to do the innovation theater and, and, and that has to stop. So, the, the simple thing is, and the, as, as George has explained, it's, it's going to take a little while because we're going to find people that do the awful paperwork for you and then it should be able to get money for the cool stuff and the good stuff that you want to do with very little effort because that's the pledge that they're, they're trying to make. And society is, has paid up the money. It's your money. It's 500 million Europeans counting on, uh, on, 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 on this to happen. Let, let's say that everybody puts aside two euros to fix the internet. Well, it's, it's more or less an order of magnitude. It sounds like a tiny amount, but we can actually do amazing things with it. You can, I know, because I know that people work, that work for NLNet, they sometimes get paid a thousand euros a month to work tirelessly on, on mind-numbing, beautiful technology. Uh, I know there, there's a lot of need, and we can scale this up. And we, we need to reinvent this internet because if we don't reinvent it, it's gonna it's maybe lasting for another thousand years. And this is not a hyperbole. It's it's fossilizing really, really fast. The ossification of the internet is a real problem because if everybody's on it and everybody has a legacy on it and it's decades old, who's gonna change it? So uh, with that I leave the floor to Marietje uh, Schaken. Uh, she's from the European Parliament. And well, she's the one that gets it thrown into her lap. Good morning, everybody. Some ladies, many gentlemen. How are you? So in my work as a member of European Parliament, I um, focus a lot on the question of how to preserve and make more robust the rule of law in an online world. Some of the areas I work on are trade, foreign policy, technology subjects, digital rights, worked on net neutrality. Uh, we just passed a resolution in the European Parliament that will make it harder to export surveillance systems to dictatorships where they might be used to violate people's human rights. Um, oh, thank you. And, and I think that's important for this community, we put in um, a caution to avoid that security researchers and pen testers would be negatively impacted and we call for delisting of export controls encryption software. So hopefully... <laughs> well, I see it's getting you awake, so let's hope it stays that way. Um, Anyway, um, last week I was in, in Davos at the World Economic Forum and I can hardly think of a bigger difference between this room and, and that uh, community of people. But what was striking and, and what I took with me uh, from Davos is actually very interesting that there was a very clear tone of concern about where digitization is heading, techtopia was definitely over, and the notion that we should put people first, human beings first, was a, a core notion that, that came across in many of the sessions. And it's one that resonates with me deeply. Uh, and I also thought it was remarkable that Mark Benioff, the uh, CEO of Salesforce, was actually calling out other CEOs for having failed to take their responsibility in leading big technology companies and essentially called for regulation to safeguard the public interest. Now, why do I say all this? Uh, one, because I, I thought it was interesting, but two, because I believe that there is a momentum, a momentum building up where there is more attention for the potential negative fallout of privatization of the web everywhere. I think one of the deep challenges that we face is that digitization often means privatization, and I don't think it serves the public interest sufficiently. 
In fact, I heard someone from Facebook saying, you know what we do at Facebook, we are a privately managed public space. That certainly raised my eyebrows. Um, I don't agree with this, obviously. I think uh, Facebook is a privately managed private online space and it's especially uh, a profit-seeking comp profit company, which, you know, it's fine, but let's not confuse things and let's look at how deep the public impact of the behavior of private companies can be. And so in thinking about the next generation internet, I believe we should really focus on strengthening the public core of the open internet, keeping the internet open, of course, in the first place. It's a challenge uh, enough as it is. Uh, emphasizing how universal rights apply to all of the people all of the time and to see how democracy can be strengthened online. Uh, I don't think we can overestimate the threats by top-down models, whether they are authoritarian governance models or profit models that increasingly impact all of us online. So when you're building the next generation internet, I encourage you to think about governance. It is very, very important what values you stick in in the front and to see what impact it has in the end. So again, I would really invite you and I hope you will consider strengthening the rule of law online. Think about values and not just efficiency and speed or I think in this community is not so important but in many other places, not just think about profit. I would also want to place a bit of a critical note and invite you to be uh, inclusive within uh, your own communities. I mean, we live in bubbles too much, I believe. It's, it's very popular to say, look, uh, politicians don't understand anything about technology. And I'm the first one to admit that that's probably true. I mean, the pace of change of technology is very, very rapid. There's usually only a subset of politicians deciding on any given topic anyway, so you cannot possibly expect every politician to know everything about every topic. What is helpful though is to reach those people that have uh, the most responsibility for changes in the field that you care about. And if I change around this assumption, I think it is safe to say that a lot of techies, geeks, programmers know little to nothing about lawmaking and politics. And maybe we should both change. Maybe we should both be more interested in the other. It's very easy to say, it's maybe even funny to say that politicians don't understand anything, but they're still decision makers. And I would suggest that tone really matters. Uh, saying we think you're, you're a bureaucratic machine, we really don't like you, but we like your money. I don't know um, how many people would like to uh, spend their Saturday morning uh, talking about that sort of proposition. Perhaps it is better to think in terms of solutions and understand that maybe governments in Europe are not perfect, European Commission is not perfect, uh, governments of our member states are not perfect, certainly members of European Parliament are not perfect, but maybe, actually, these people are the best we have. They're elected by all of you. They also represent your opinion, at least hopefully some of them do, and so I think it is good to work with them, because who else, who else besides civil society is protecting the public interest online? So in closing, even though individuals have been hugely empowered by the use of technology and there's still a lot of promise that has not been manifested and I really hope we can do it together. Governments and what they do still matters. States and what they do still matters. They can do a lot of harm, but they can also do some good. And I think that the EU is in a unique position increasingly. Think about some of the steps that have been taken on the European level recently. We've seen the General Data Protection Regulation. We have enshrined net neutrality into EU law. Competition authorities are fining big tech companies when they are violating competition law, as they do with other companies. And so the notion that the EU is increasingly a norm setter in the digital space, I believe is something that is very, very essential and that we should all use. Uh, the EU is increasingly more 
uh, credible, especially compared to the United States, unfortunately, and compared to uh, regimes where it's not the voice of the people that determines who governs. I also think what's quite fundamental, that's really in our DNA in Europe and we should not forget, is that there is still quite a profound understanding that people deserve to be protected from government too. And that is something that we need to um, underline in everything we do. So when we, when we go on in, in tackling new challenges like algorithmic accountability or ethics in artificial intelligence, the security of the Internet of Things, etc., etc., I think you all can help shape that process. I hope you will uh, be invited and participate in shaping the next generation Internet, uh, not so much by, uh, by um, staying in your own worlds, but really reaching out to others and making sure that this is an inclusive as possible discussion that embraces the public interest of the public Internet and uh, manages it in a way that benefits all of the people anywhere in the world. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Hey, um, can, I, can I go ahead with a question? First of all, I want to congratulate you, uh, co congratulate you for reaching out and bridging the gaps between our communities. I think that's very important, as you mentioned. Um, and I, I definitely share some of your concerns about where uh, our digital society is heading. But you mentioned some, some things um, on how uh, regulation is evolving and um, my concern is that the more regulation we put, the more we lock out the small, the, the small guys that are trying to uh, uh, build out solutions, companies. And there's already a lot of regulatory hurdles in European Union because we have so many different countries where people have to uh, basically um, 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 be careful with all the legislation uh, in, in, in these different countries. How are we going to... Be, be able to regulate the big, gu big guys, but at the same time make sure that the small, uh, that the small people don't have uh, these hurdles to pass through, you know, like GDPR. It's, while it's good, at the same time it's so difficult for a small, companies to, for a small company to, to uh, be compliant with it. Thank you. I hope everyone can still hear because it's a kind of challenging setup with people changing rooms and asking questions at the same time. But I understood your question clearly. So I think indeed creating a level playing field where there can be fair competition and where there can be access and uh, ability to comply for everyone is a key task for us. But I wouldn't look at regulation in black and white terms. I mean, if you think about net neutrality, for example, it is deliberately designed to protect smaller startups, uh, individual internet users from the overreach by the huge tech giants. Uh, and it's, you know, it depends on what kind of regulation you're talking about that, that you know, may have unintended negative consequences for SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, and I, I hear you very clearly that we must be very careful for that. But Unfortunately, the excuse of a negative impact for SMEs is also often used to stop, you know, better, better principal uh, protection from, from taking place. So, for example, when I was working on uh, preventing the export of surveillance systems to dictatorships, the argument against any regulation I heard most was, well, it's going to be impossible for the SMEs. So, it's very good to target exactly what is the problem. Uh, for smaller players, and I agree that it's a legitimate concern, instead of making it a sort of blanket argument that can also be abused. That would be my, my reply, but I principally agree with what you're saying. It's something to be very careful about. 
can I uh, continue on? Because I was, I'm a bit puzzled between the, the, the second and the third presentation. I heard something talking about Internet of the People, and then I hear someone saying that he wants to change the fundamental protocols of the Internet, which I have really cl no clue what it practically means. But what I know is that there is already a lot of people and a lot of communities that are engaged in a lot of amazing projects and that it's not a uh, through uh, directive approach of changing the fundamentals of things that you will embed the people into uh, transforming practices, transforming structures, and transforming users. So the people need to be uh, starting from the communities that are already at work and they need to be as diverse as not only technical. So this is exactly what we're planning, to go with the grain of development, to go with the grain of uh, uh, bottom-up innovation rather than to do top-down hyperscaling projects that fail to fund the communities that actually do it.